Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Tonight I want to talk about forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 32. Give me the amplified version of that. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 32. He says, Become useful and helpful to one another. Become useful and helpful to one another. Become useful and helpful to one another. You have to be useful and helpful to your fellow man. Okay? Tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted. All of these things, he says, we have to be. He says we have to be compassionate, we have to be understanding, we have to be loving hearted. Our hearts must be with love. Are you following what I'm saying? Forgiving uh -huh, one another, what does the Amplified say in the brackets? Readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. Why do I underline the word readily and freely? Readily and freely. I love that the Amplified emphasizes that. One, you must build a life of Christianity that expects that people are not perfect in the flesh. Are you hearing me? You must know that people in the flesh are not perfect. They cannot be perfect. And yes, we are Christian. We have treasures, but they are in earthen vessels that the excellence of power might be of God. But in the realization that they are flesh, even the scripture says, and God said, but they are flesh and of dust. Okay? He says, I will not contend with man any further. Why? Because they are flesh and blood. Yes, the person is born again. This sister is born again. This brother is born again. Yes, but they are in the flesh. Are you hearing me? They carry a body. And so because they carry a body, you have to tune your mind before you're even offended. You must have the attitude of being ready to forgive. You understand? You have to be ready. I must know that I'm going to anoint Sam one day, but if I do, he's ready to forgive me. You understand what I'm saying? I can abuse the fact that he's ready to forgive me. That the Lord will deal with me. But I must still expect that in offense he's ready to forgive me. Are you hearing me? And this thing, when you get married, you understand it more. <laughs> you understand? Because you're living with someone, they're in your space. Are you hearing me? And so if you don't tune your head in the readiness, if you enter marriage when you're not in the readiness, you understand what I'm saying? For me, when I said I'm going to marry, eh, I told myself I have forgiven. I didn't even waste my time trying to say I'll forgive. No, I tuned the brain and I told it, forgiven. Tuned, configured. Do you understand what I'm saying? You start having peace. Praise God. You must learn to deal with people that way. Tune your brain to know that I will forgive. Someone will offend me. My brother, my sister, my friend will offend me. My pastor will offend me. Tune. Are you hearing me? And then say, now I am ready to what? To forgive. 
He says the Christian life, the Christian, the God kind of life is ready to forgive. The God kind. The God kind. That one is ready to forgive. Are you hearing me? But even deeper, it is free to forgive. In other words, some people, even in the readiness to forgive, they don't have the strength to forgive. They don't have the ability to forgive. There are people who say, you know, I want to. You check my heart. I'm ready, but I can't. Because some plays back and reminds me what he did to me, what she did to me, what they did to me. How could they do this to me? And that's how you know that some people struggle. Some, even when the readiness is there, something just refuses. They want to, but they're not free. And that's when you should know that forgiveness is a freedom. Forgiveness is a liberty. I am free from you. I am free from those who annoy me and free from those who disturb my peace and free from those who harm me. I am free from them. In other words, if you have unforgiveness, you are bound to the person that annoys you. You are bound. And being bound to them means that you're moving under their thermostat. It means that they are defining in sort your destiny. In part, your next step of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, to be free from somebody, it means that regardless of what they do to you, their evil does not consume you into doing evil. That's freedom. Did you understand what I just said? That regardless of how people are hard on you, their evil cannot consume you enough to do evil. Let them be bad. That's them. That's them and their God. They have their issues with God. But I'm not going to get into the space of being consumed by another man's evil. In being so, that means I carry what they have extended toward me. Because when you do not forgive, it means that in some sort you carry a portion of their likeness spiritually. If you allow their sin to consume you. It means that in principle you are one with them. But there has to be a difference between you, okay, and the person who offends you. But there has to be a difference. Okay, so what if they're like that? Yes, let them be. That's who they are. You know, when you're still younger, you think you can change people. As you grow older, so you go into the application of thinking, if I do this, this one will change. If I do that, and then you do everything. But as you grow older, you start to realize, you know, some chaps are not to change now. Not that they will never change, but they're not to change now, or they're not to change by you. And then you appreciate and say, you know what? I believe she will change, but maybe not with me. You understand? And you just leave them to God, because God is the only one who has the ability to change the human heart. God has not called us to change people. Anybody can change. Anybody can what? Can change. But they need the intervention of the hand of God to be changed. So when you think that you can change them as an individual, try. As you grow, you realize some people can't change. They can know it's blue and refuse to admit it is blue and die not admitting that it is what? It is blue. And so sometimes as you grow up, you adopt a healthy compromise of as long as your demons don't cross over my side, you got it there, you understand? <laughs> Keep your madness, you understand? As we pray for you, you get it? You understand what I'm saying? As long as your demons don't cross my hands, you understand? And you even learn to tolerate them. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you realize, I, uh, I shouldn't have started it? Huh? You start, eh? you think that we are going to start and understand each other. You know, when you do this, this is wrong. Eh? Yes. And then when you do this, this is wrong. Ah, I disagree. Eh? And on an obvious thing. And then you're like, why did I start this conversation? You understand? Eh? Because it's so obvious. But the things that are obvious to some people are not obvious to everybody. You understand what I'm saying? And you can even die of stress 
and hypertension trying to make obvious what is not obvious to some person. Human beings are like that. Who convinced the man that he can put bombs on himself and walk into innocent lives and detonate them? And he was raised by a woman and breastfed on her breast and he entered the place where human beings are and put bombs on him and somebody convinced him under any thought possible. It even shocks you. But under any thought possible, under any circumstance possible, that he can wake up and meet people who have never offended him, have never done anything to him, don't know him, you understand? If he's saying they are kafiris, is he sure everyone in there is not circumcised? Or that is not Muslim? Many get a plane. Are you hearing me? In the name of faith. And direct it into a building. There's a woman walking with her child. There's a man who just left overseas, probably moved 10,000 kilometers or miles away to go into that state to make a living for his own household and is the sole breadwinner and the hope of his tribe in Africa and is walking on that same floor and this mad chap directs his plane into that building and kills them and then you go back and realize he did not kill them because he's depressed he's not a maniac no somebody sat him down and convinced him of an idea and he conceived it and he killed people that's people. You know, I can understand if you say, no, 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 he took drugs and then he got high on drugs and then got a gun and then went shooting. I would understand, no, it's the drugs doing it. But this one sits in a class and he is taught and tutored in an ideology and that ideology consumes him and he gets a bomb and enters a place. He's not even planting one. He is in the people. Are you hearing me? And then he calls on his God and pulls that trigger and kills people. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's human beings. And that's the world God sent us into. And he says, go ye into the world. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. He says, go ye into the world. He doesn't say, build your small buildings. And that's why I always tell ministers, these guys who think, oh, you can build a city and then from there keep your people. No. God told us, go ye into. He didn't say, build your own shelters away from. Because you think, no, Calvin tried it in Netherlands, failed. Alexander Dowie tried it in Zion, Illinois, he failed. Many people, the Puritans tried it in Holland and failed. They tried it in America and failed. It just didn't work. It just doesn't work. God has not called us to get Christian communities in one area and then put our houses there. Such so that your child crosses the road into another Christian's home. You understand? And the school is Christian. And all the kids are Christian. And then your boy grows up and falls in love with a Christian girl in the Christian neighborhood. Mama. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not how God has called us. No. Bring your kids to church. They'll meet each other. That's okay. Communities. God has called us to go into those communities where we live and change them. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you find yourself in a bad community, it is because God knows there is a purpose of you attached to that community as long as you exist there. Are you hearing me? And so don't leave communities because they are bad. No. Go into communities to change them. That's the mentality. We occupy a little living. Are you hearing me? Spoil the door. You understand what I'm saying? Now, how much more the life of the believer, if it gets into a corrupted community, what does it do? It changes it. And that's the mentality that Christian faith is supposed to have, that we are sent to change communities wherever you are. Some of you live in areas you have never prayed for. Ever since you went there, you have never opened your mouth and said, Father, I pray for one day here. No. No. Every time you get into your prayers, Father, my God, my come. You understand? My, my, my. No. Get more responsibility. Extend your responsibility into your home area. Pray for your neighbors. Are you hearing me? Pray for them. Pray for your streets. You understand? There's a kabite pass when I'm going home. Every time I reach there, I curse it. And then I continue. <laughs> Every time I reach there, I pronounce anathema. 
Shakarapa. For with it, I kill it to the root. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? And then sometimes, the Lord is my witness. Sometimes when I'm passing on potholes, I command them, die in Jesus' name. Die in my heart. Die. Potholes, die. And then after like some weeks, they come and cover them and I say, Rakotaya Bakaya. But some of you live in places where even your car sleep like, Whoop. and then it goes on two tires. Are you hearing me? And when you go on two tires, you don't even speak to the road. No, you just continue. To, you understand? No. <laughs> Reach the pothole, speak to it. Say in the name of Jesus. May the authorities of this area get money to make this road. Yes, you might not be a driver. Are you hearing me? But by the fact that you're passing on a bad road, speak to it. Shout amen. amen. Glory to God. And he adds, he says, as God in Christ forgave you. As God in Christ forgive you. In other words, the attitude God had in Christ was I forgive you, I choose to forgive you, I am ready to forgive you, and I am free to forgive you. God didn't struggle to forgive us. The believers should not struggle to forgive you. Are you hearing me? And so he said, okay. Question. If he says, as God in Christ forgive you, how did God in Christ forgive us? How did he forgive us? explain the forgiveness we have in Christ because you're telling me to forgive as God in Christ forgave me. So, what does it mean to forgive like God? What does the God kind of forgiveness do? How does the God kind of forgiveness operate? How? How? Isaiah chapter 43 verses 25. Again, the Amplified. This is how God forgives. He says, I, comma, even I am he, okay, God, who blots out and cancels your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. That is how God forgives. He says, I am the God who blots out and cancels, blots out means rubs away, and counsels your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins anymore. That's me. That's God. That's what he says in Hebrews 8, 12. He says, For I'll be merciful and gracious toward their sin and I will remember their deeds of unrighteousness no more. That's how God forgives. That's the God kind of forgiveness. Okay? Now, it's deep if you think about it. Meaning, you do something wrong, God forgives you, he blots out your sin, he cancels your transgressions, comma, and he says, for my own sake, he does it for him as God. Why? It is the only way he can be God. I love that he added, for my own sake. In other words, forgiveness benefits the forgiver more than the forgiven. Let me say it again. Forgiveness benefits the forgiver more than the forgiven. If I forgive, I am better than the man I have forgiven. The man I have forgiven will receive my forgiveness, will receive my mercy, will receive my heart of love, my loving kindness and compassionate, my understanding. Thank God that helps them be better. But on the other side, I who forgives, I am better. I am better. Spiritually and in every other aspect of way. Why? Because it makes me a man of God. It keeps me as a man of God. God forgives us because he is God. Are you hearing me? And you forgive because you have the God kind of life. When you refuse to forgive, it means that you worship God with your lips, but your heart is far. It means that you prefer to keep a grudge with an individual than walk in the God kind of life. 
means you made a choice deliberately to keep someone in your heart with anger than keeping the good kind of love. And I always tell people, when you ever get to a place where you have to choose between being carnal and being godly, always choose to be godly. Always. I'll tell you why some people struggle with that. Some people, it's just one offense, and it's bad enough, and it's there. But some people, the offenses that have been hit on their lives, some of them have caused lifetime damages. And they don't know how to live after that. Okay? Some of them have caused lifetime damages. And some of them, it's not lifetime damages, but some of them, it's been a series of many annoyances. Eh? Someone annoys you, you forgive, and then they annoy you, you forgive, but they have not counted that they are 70, we are coming there yet later. But you know, they annoy you, they annoy you, they annoy you, and then one day you become a chiboto fool. Okay? And God says, no, if you filled up because of many annoyances, it means in the other ones you did not forgive. Because what has been filling your bottle, what has been filling your heart, if you did not remember no more. Or oh, some, it's the damage. One time a lady came, and her husband did something to her and put a damage, a lifetime permanent damage on her life because of what the husband did. And I did not know that. So she comes for healing. And so I pray for her. And as I'm praying for her, the Holy Spirit tells me, this was the first time I ever heard God say such a profound word. It stuck with me. The Lord told me, tell this woman, if you never forgive that man for what he did to you, then the consequence of his act toward you will never leave your body. The consequence of what he did toward you will never leave your body. Because every time you own unforgiveness, it means you recognize that consequence. And I cannot work in faith to heal that because you are against the law of faith. See, you must understand how the law of faith works. Praise God. Galatians chapter 5, verses 6. Give me the Amplified Bible. Let me explain the law of faith. It says, for if we are in Christ Jesus, he says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith, listen, activated and energized and expressed and working through love so if you walk out of love you can't activate your faith you can't energize your faith you can't express your faith you can't make your faith work your faith cannot work even what looks like a permanent damage it can leave when you forgive because forgiveness is an act of love your faith can never fully work, express itself, activate fully, be energized fully to have the results you want in God unless you learn to forgive. Because forgiveness is part of your healing. You understand what I'm saying? If you live in unforgiveness, then seek revenge with the mind that that consequence will never leave you and its effect. That damage will never leave you and its effect. It will never leave you. It will never leave you. A girl came and took photos of me on the streets years ago and I was preaching on the streets. You understand what I'm saying? And she took photos of me and the next morning I saw sex cult front page of a tabloid. Are you hearing me? And I remembered what she did and what she went through to get to me. I'd refused. I sensed it in my spirit. I told one of my folks, I said, this is the wrong thing. I have a bad feeling. No, Papa, she's not. Long and short, this girl is in my office. They write a foolish article of pages. Okay? And as I'm walking on the streets, I find parents, and parents insult me. You took our children to destroy their destinies. And one pastor got that article. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that day I was driving, and, and this fellow is on Christian radio, reading page by page of that article, cutting, slicing, dissecting me, destroying everything. Are you hearing me? That season I had three children 
that were battered by their parents for coming to Fanero. Three. I had experiences of three students suspended in a high school because they were found with Fanero devotions and that it's a sex cult. The damage went on and on to secondary schools and universities and you know you walk on the streets with a very innocent mind but there's someone who looks at you as death. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because one person wrote an article. Yes, they damaged. They wrote a damage on a ministry. But if I had set it in my heart to pray with these knees and the God I have, I know in 30 minutes, if I just went down in 30 minutes for that guy, I know who I am. I have looked back at the people who wounded me and I wept before God and I saw the consequences. And I saw it whether five, six, ten years, I saw the consequences because the vengeance is of the Lord. I know it. I worked with people who are difficult. And recently I remember that everyone who frustrated me is not working. Not because I cast them, but because they touched the man of God. So I knew the destiny of this girl and what she had done herself into. And the Spirit of the Lord told me, this can only lift up your life if you just pray peace for her. And forgiveness. I just found myself praying for her. Oh yes, we were getting the blows, but my intercession was for her life. I said, God, even this one needs you. Are you hearing me? Three, four years later, God has done stuff that people reach me every day. Even last evening, a man said, I was one of the people who hated you most. But I tuned on television. And I had you once. And from then on, I repented. Do you know how many people have walked to me to repent? And they'll continue repenting. But if I had chosen vengeance, I would have left something in the atmosphere that would have affected my ministry. But I refused to be consumed by the evil of this young girl. <laughs> stories after stories. Stories after stories. Stories after stories. Someone one time abused me very heavily and insulted me, did all these kinds of things to me. And then they ran mad. And then I was called. They ran mad in another country. And God told me, get this seed, give it over for the family to help their sick child. The same person who offended you. You understand what I'm saying? And I did. And it took that person three years. They called me the third year and said, Apostle, I offended you. And later when I came back to Sanita, I got to learn, you paid the tickets for my parent to treat me. I'm sorry. And I told her it was Christ in me. That was the only way they would understand God. And you have to live a life that does the best even to people that least expect it because when I do that something activates my faith something energizes my faith something makes my faith work are you hearing me something makes my faith work I see that the miraculous increases I see that the anointing increases I see that demonstration of power increases I see that the numbers increase. I see that everything in the ministry increases. But it's not because I went to a prayer mountain. It's because of that act of love. Those acts of love. Those things can preserve you. They can give you many more years, even if you are to die tomorrow. Forgiveness can extend another 20 years on your life. God can preserve you simply because you chose to do good to somebody who does opposite. Somebody shout, Amen. Tell your neighbor, faith worketh by love. Praise God. Tell him again, faith worketh by love. Hallelujah. And so he says that I forgive and I remember not. So he says, I don't only blow it out for my sake, like I've explained, but two also, I don't remember them. In other words, not remembering does not mean that Satan will not bring images in your head about what he or she did to you. But those images are not it. You must know that those are just images Satan is bringing back 
to remind you that you have not forgiven. But those images are not it. But if you respond to those images, then it means you have not forgiven. How? Some of you like repeating yourself. Remember when you did. Remember, 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 remember. Every time you say remember, it means it's in your memory. Are you hearing me? Practically, it's impossible for the human mind to forget a bad deed, a big bad deed, right? But spiritually, to choose to forget, to refuse to talk about it again, to refuse it to consume your mind even when the devil brings the images, that by God is forgetting. Are you hearing me? And how do you do that? You practice it. The moment the devil brings an image to you, remember, ready and free, you say, I forgive. I forgive, Satan, I forgive. Whatever you're showing me is just an image of what happened, but to me it no longer exists. I forgive. The more you continue confessing that, you know, it's one thing to forgive and it's another to heal. Some people forgive before they heal. Are you hearing me? But the healing process comes in how you choose to configure your mind and your confession. Healing comes easily when you continue saying, I forgive Apostle Emma. I forgive Apostle Emma. I forgive Pastor Joshua. I forgive him. I know that I forgive him. Devil, I might feel the pain, but it's not there in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe I forgive them. I confess that I forgive them. I don't remember anything. Those images you're bringing are so vague to me. They're obscure. They are foreign. They're not familiar. I'm a child of God, and Godness is my familiarity. The more you continue speaking that, the more you realize that the freedom starts to rumble in your spirit. And as it continues to do that, you feel that the forgiveness comes easily. Somebody shout amen. Shout amen. How many times should I forgive? Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how many times may my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let it go? Because now we're talking about letting it go. So God asked, how many times? Hallelujah. As many as up to seven times, he says. And Jesus answered and told him, I tell you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven. So if there's anybody who has the ability to annoy you 70 times, seven times, for those of you who annoy people, be counting. You understand what I'm saying? What is that? 490. Okay. So, you be counting. So, there are some people who say, uh huh, Kakati, 490 times. Kari, Tandika. You annoy. One. Two. But that's for a day. The next day you have to count again. Because <laughs> these masses are new every morning. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So you understand what I'm saying? So, how many times? 70 times 7. Akati. A human being doesn't even have the ability to annoy you 100 times in one day. Not even 50 times in one day, because one can audience can snap you. Some of you, one can audience like this, camera. It's enough to change you into a beast. One. But there are 490 remaining. Praise God. Hallelujah. In first and second Corinthians, there's a story of a man which committed incest. And Paul, in a lot of anger, said, you know, there's that guy who has done things that are not even common among the heathen. For he took his own father's wife. You remember that story? And he says, when I come, we're going to judge him. That was angry Paul with the apostles. You understand? Why? Because he did even what the heathen don't do. You understand? It means incest is not right. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's supposed to be obvious to the believer. This was his father's wife. Now how much more your sister, your brother? You understand what I'm saying? That's incest too. More incest actually. So, then they banish the guy and speak judgment over him and then he falls sick. And in 2 Corinthians, verses 5, let's go to the Amplified, Paul brings back that whole narration. 
and he says, but if someone, the one among you who committed incest, has caused all this grief and pain, he has caused it to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely, he has distressed all of you. For such a one, this censure by the majority which he has received is sufficient punishment. Instead of further rebuke now, you should rather turn and graciously forgive and comfort and encourage him to keep him from being overwhelmed by excessive sorrow and despair. He says, I therefore beg you to reinstate him in your affections and assure him of your love for him. For this was my purpose in writing to you, he says, to test your attitude and see if you would stand the test whether you are obedient and all together agreeable to following my orders in everything. He says, if you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one and which I have forgiven. If I have forgiven anything, has been for your sex in the presence and with the approval of Christ Jesus the Messiah to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions. We are not ignorant that Satan works through unforgiveness to destroy men and ministries and families. So this fellow, when the church judged him and all, he became so sullen and sad and sorrowful and disgraced. And then the man of the spirit realizes that if this man continues this way, in excessive sorrow and despair, in that overwhelming pain of judgment, he might commit suicide or be destroyed as a believer. And Paul knew, uh uh, if we continue this way, we're going to lose him. Even the one who committed incest, he said, we need that one also. So he tells these guys, no, this was just a test to see whether you'll abide by my instruction. Now, let me see you restore that man and convince him of your love toward him. Are you hearing me? And here Paul uses the word test. Here Paul uses the word test. Yes, they did this. Yes, he's incestuous. Yes. But what is the obligation of the church? Paul tells the church, look, yes, he's incestuous and he did wrong. But the guy has repented. He has been beaten. Are you hearing me? He's even sick. During that time he felt sick. He was judged. You know when the church judges a man who is of the order, the early church was very anointed. No, these funny ones of our time. They were really very anointed. Are you hearing me? No offense really intended, but today many people play in the gospel. I don't even think they know what church is. Paul sees that this severe distress and the overwhelming pain and conviction and sorrow and all this judgment around him was going to kill the man. So he said, uh-uh, reinstate that man in your affections and assure him of your love for him. He says, I beg you. Meaning that if we see that some people are sorry, right, we have to see how we restore them back to where they were. Or oh, what if somebody is not sorry and they are adamant of their sin? Well, with that one, we forgive them and let them be. But if somebody shows a sign of sorrow, not acting sorrow, but real sorrow from the heart, God says, even if they killed your mother or killed your own father, go back and reinstate them and assure your love and affection toward them and tell them we love you. And now we have a problem that there are people who did that, or some even less, they screwed up. Are you hearing me? The Lord impressed it upon our hearts to restore them. We restored and assured them of our love for them. Are you hearing me? And then they spoke out there who look at us. And when they do, they start to think that we are compromising. We are being one with the sinner. How long will the man be a sinner? Do you know there are people who once you do one thing forever, even when you repent and change, for them their head will tell them you're still that woman. They will never be convinced I hate religion there I have unforgiveness with religion the spirit pray for me I hate the spirit of religion because the spirit of religion will not your sin in 1990 and keep it even in 2019 you're that sin that's why there is these examples of David, Bathsheba I get pissed when people give those examples but you know David stayed with the mark so what, what mark do you have? You're even going to die when you're not in the books. You have no listen to the church. There's nothing building about you. 
Back with David. Muveko, Muveko. Leave the man of God. You know, some people fail to understand that when God says, this is a man of God, he is a man of God. Is he yours? What? No. Man of God. Mumulekere, leave him to God. He's a man of God. He's a man of God. So if you've heard, he's a man of God. Where is your part again here? Help us. Mbozo Jirawa. No, but even me, I have right. Of what? Of what? Have you noticed that the people who judge others of certain things fall worse into the same? Do you think God has uncovered all of us? <laughs> Directly interpreted. If the Lord had opened you up, you'd not be here. <laughs> My God. Thank God for His grace. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so Paul warns us as a church and say, yes, people might be funny, but when we see them breaking, if they don't break, let's stay forgiving and loving them from their world. Do you understand? Because again, he also warns us to be careful. Some people are not repentant. Yeah? It doesn't mean I will not forgive you. But it doesn't mean that because I've forgiven you, therefore we'll be chatting on Facebook and texting every day. Are you hearing me? Because it's one thing for a man to seek forgiveness and restoration. It's another for a man to stay adamant in their sin. Okay? That doesn't mean that because they're adamant, we don't forgive them. No, we are obligated to forgive them. But our dealings must be wise. Are you hearing me? Because forgiving someone does not mean that that person has changed. They can even hurt you again tomorrow. You understand what I'm saying? So you have to be wise when you're dealing with people who break you. Okay? But if you see an act of repentance, and I've learned that as a man of God, every time I see that act of someone coming through, God has told me always, reach out your hand quickly and pull them out. Always do that. When someone shows that, you know, you screwed up, but I'm trying, pull them out. Quickly. Quickly. Why? Because if they start to do that and then you pull back from them and they are destroyed, it's your fault. It's your what? It's your fault. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith worketh by love. Second last. If you learn to forgive, your life of prayer is effective. Hallelujah. Matthew eleven twenty three. Again the amplified. He says, Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted about and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. For this reason I am telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you, and you will get it. And whenever, and whenever, whenever, 25, you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Leave it, let it go, in order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your failings and shortcomings. He says, look, whatever you ask in his name and believe you have received, it shall be received. Yay, fire, post, rakat, and now I ask for shata. You make your request. He says, but whenever you start praying, search your heart first. You know, some of you skip that and enter into tongues. You go into tongues straight. You skip this thing here, this thing you've done to an individual. And then you skip directly into prayer. Then you find someone doing like this. My God. Don't skip verses 25. About Uganda. Don't what? Skip verses 25. In fact, for me, this has been like the litmus test. Every time I struggle to pray, I first search my heart whether I have an issue with someone. Every time. Now somebody says, Pastor, pray for me. I'm struggling to pray. You're struggling to pray? Yes, I'm struggling to pray. Search yourself. You might find you have an issue with someone and because of that the spirit is nudging you it's telling you look you want to go into prayer and I, 
Jesus, you here. Can you deal with it? No. Jesus, I... No, 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 no. You will receive whatever. If you believe you've received it, you shall have whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. But let's deal with this first. And it's always something. Every time you're struggling praying, search your heart first. First pause the prayer and search your heart. If you have an issue with someone, the Lord will bring it up to the surface. And when you say, I let go of that person, before you know it, you will not tell your lips to speak. No, you'll find them blabbing. Why? Because you have dealt with this issue. How many people forget that? And they are praying and they are asking, why don't I see results? No word, no prophetic word can deliver this person. It's not there. Even if we speak prophetic words over you, we are wasting time if you have not dealt with it. Because God is not going to go against this because the prophet, the apostle said, no. Fix this. Fix this. And lastly, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12, give me amplified again. He says, not that I have now attained, he says, this ideal, or have already been made perfect. He says, but I press on to lay hold of. He says, I've not yet been there, I'm not yet there, I'm trying. He says, but yet I press on to lay hold of, or grasp and make my own, that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me known of. In verses 13, he says, I do not consider brethren that I've captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do, it is my own aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward for what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize which God in Christ Jesus is calling us. And he says in verses 15, so let us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. And if any in any respect you have a different attitude, God will make that clear. Now he's talking to the mature. He said, as you mature and grow in God, as you understand your full space of maturing in God, he also tells you, forget your past. In other words, some of you forgive everybody except yourself. Some of you forgive everybody except yourself. And some of you don't struggle with unforgiveness for others. Some struggle with unforgiveness for self. It's easy for them to forgive others, but they don't forgive themselves. Forgive yourself. Yes, you messed up. It's true. Yes. Yes, I hear them. I hear the words your heart is saying. But Apostle, yes. 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 Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. A woman came to me once and said, Apostle, I've had three miscarriages. I'm tired, and she was weeping. And this has happened several times, about three or four, but that one time I'll never forget. A woman came, and as I said, let's pray. I stretched out my hands, and as I was praying, in a vision, I was taken to the age of 15. And I said, you are pregnant at the age of 15 and aborted a child. And she broke down and started weeping and wept and wept and wept. And she says, I think this is why God has failed to give me my own because I killed a child. And I told her, wrong. I told her, even that one, God doesn't remember it. And I said, even as a man of God, I have seen it by the Spirit. Because the devil has always brought it to you by remembrance. The Lord showed me that this is what is holding back her womb. Why? Because every time she conceives it in her mind that I'm scarring because I killed a child, the devil there has legal rights because she has directed her faith negatively. And so every child that comes, that child finds death in the womb. I told her, forgive yourself. He says, I am the Lord who blots out your sins and cancels your transgressions. He says, and I will not remember your sins. So 
I told her, if God died, remember, he chose to bury it. Why does it still come back to your head? I told her, receive forgiveness. We don't need to ask for a child. Receive forgiveness. And then I prayed with her, and I told her, receive forgiveness. Receive forgiveness. She said, I receive forgiveness. That next year, she had a child. And from then on, her womb has been open. She has children. Every year, every time she wants to have children, she has children. That cycle has broken off her. And I realize that some of you, what is holding you back is you messed up so bad and you can't forgive yourself. A lady walked into my office one day and said, Apostle, I've slept with 24 men in one year. I have given up the hope of ever finding a man. Just pray for me that God keeps me from this thing. I'm not expecting marriage. That's asking for too much. Some of you are laughing because you are eh, you are so holy. But this is a situation that happened to someone. And I told her wrong. God will not only deliver you from this nonsense, but he will give you a good man. Apostle, with the things I've done, do you know what I've done to the sons of men? She said. And I said, I don't need to know what you did to them, but I know that there is a God who does not remember that. And I said, you can start another story, another life, another thing from now and make the rest of your life beautiful. Well, now what I'm looking at, wherever you start from, you can start and redeem. It's possible. Hallelujah. And she found a man. <laughs> and the guy came, he didn't want to know. He said, whether they are 100 or 200, me, God told me you're my wife. So what are we talking about? I told her, marry this one. Don't even waste your time. Don't waste... Marry that one. Don't waste your time. The chap just had God. What are we again talking about here? Are you hearing me? Because he was not interested in the past. He was interested in the present hour and the future of his life. And the woman he married. Forgive yourself. Some of you, your heart is struggling to say, hey God, I did too much. And because of that, there's some things you expect in your subliminal. Someone subconsciously there, there are things that when they happen, you're like, ah, you know, <laughs> but anyway, I did this, so if this happens, no, 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 get a rubber, cancel and blot out. You're perfect. Say amen. Thank God for forgiveness. Just raise your hands. Get to your feet. Come on. Jesus Christ, I'm humbled at your sacrifice. You became the
even as Christ in God forgave you. And I'm praying for someone here who has struggled to let go. And tonight you understand by God that the saving grace of God can only operate, the faith of God can only work, and your life can only move on if you let go. I pray for your heart. I pray for your mind. I pray for your life. And tonight, in the name of Jesus, you let that thing go. You will not mention it again. You will not allow it to get to your mind again. I refuse that thing to take control over your life, over your destiny. I refuse that thing to confuse you and consume you, to be a man or woman that you know is not you. Vengeance is not yours. Revenge is not yours. Anger is not yours. There are people here who have contemplated to kill and poison other people. Some of you, you have done it, not in action, but in the words and thoughts that you've had toward people. Some of you have imagined people dying. That ends today. In Jesus' name. 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 Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise because for who saw the sunset free, they are free indeed. And if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ and you're not born again, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm here. My heart is broken to you. I have heard your word and tonight I choose to give you my life. I believe with my heart, I confess with my mouth that you died and rose again for my sins and you are raised for my glory. Tonight, I take you as Lord of my life. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.